Good morrow and welcome to Trip Tips. Well, today we're talking about a character who well, as described by Lyman Rutledge in In the Isles of Shoals and Lore and Legend from 1965, is someone who no breath of scandal has ever touched. <laughs> yes, mislead them. Nothing ever changes over time, right? <laughs> well, maybe people see him differently now than they did then. <laughs> yes. Now tell these poor morsels who you're talking about. Well, today we're talking about John Smith. <laughs> Today's question is: What was John Smith doing in the Isles of Shoals? Meet John Smith. No, the other John. No, the other John. Jeez, how many Johns are on the Isles? Okay, yes. Meet John Smith. John was baptized on January 6th, 1580, and grew up on a farm until he was 16 or 17. His zest for adventure coaxed him to enlist in battle abroad. He fought for the Netherlands in their independence war against Spain. By 1601, he was reassigned to fight as a mercenary along Austrian forces against Hungarian Turks. The following year, he was captured by the enemy, but fought his way out to England via transversing Russia by 1604-1605. By 1607, John was ready to travel again. He helped lead an effort to colonize a little unknown area called the United States of America. Besides, we're not here to talk about that voyage. And if we did, we'd have to be this crazy romance show to talk about that. Are you seriously basing your history off of Disney movies now? When has Disney fabricated anything? You're kidding, right? Birds. John Smith arrived in 1607 to start Jamestown, and he led as president until 1609, when there was an incident with his powder bag that forced him to return to England. This endeavor became the source of controversy in one of his writings that we will not be diving into. After he recovered, John was commissioned by Sir Ferdinando Gorges. Well, at least the ladies thought so. Oh yeah, come on, high five or wing. John's mission was to collect whales, fish, furs, silver, gold, and any goods as he surveyed North Virginia or Norumbega. However, New England was already claimed by France and called New France, but eh, England could care less. In 1614, John Smith made it to these isles, instantly decided to call them his own. Smith's Isles. In his various works from 1616 to 1622, he described them. The remarkable isles and mountains for landmarks are these. Smith's Isles are a heap together, none near them, against a Mitticus. A many of barren rocks, the most overgrown with such shrubs and sharp winds. You can hardly pass them, without either grass or wood, but three or four short, shrubby old cedars. And of all four parts of the world that I have yet seen not inhabited, could I have but means to transport a colony, I would rather live here than anywhere. And if it did not maintain itself, 
or we, but once indifferently well-fitted, let us starve! By that acquaintance, I have of them. I may call them my children, for they may have been my wife, my hawks, my hounds, my cards, my dice, and in total, my best content. I particularly like where John Smith says that they can't sustain themselves, they'll just starve. Historians believe that John Smith landed and made his observations from the summit of Hog Island, now Appledore. The now entranced John attempted to return to New England in years to follow, but was constantly stopped by either shipwrecks, pirates, or non-cooperating winds. That's right, boy! Can you not read the signs? Keep the change, you filthy animal! Now scram! He managed to publish his map, and it was to be used by the new Plymouth settlers. John Smith was the first European to indicate the shoals on a map, and it was accepted by geographers for many years. So then why are they the Isles of Shoals and not Smith's Isles? Well, that's because John Smith was the first European to map them, not the first to use them. Around 4000 BCE, the Native Americans used this area as fishing grounds until the water gap became too great. After some time after Leif Erikson in 1000 CE, unnamed fishermen came down to see the shoals and named it for themselves. The shoals, named for the enormous schools of fish found there, was already named by the fishermen. The islands were already named too. For example, Smutty Nose was from a smutch of dark seaweed on the nose of an extending rock. <laughs> Malaga was in reference to Spanish vineyards remembered by Spanish sailors. Duck had a freshwater pond in its center where ducks rested during migration. Hog Island resembled a fat hog wallowing in brine. I mean, if you squint, I guess. Star Island was so named for the broken crags that extended in all directions like the spangles of a star. Although, I don't know if I could see that even if I squinted. Old fishermen are notorious drunks, folks. Don't let your drunk uncle name your islands next time. It looks more like an Africa to me anyway. Well, this area was called the Isles of Shoals by these fishermen years before John Smith dropped by, so Smith's Isles never caught on. He obviously was not thinking of the people, as he never mentions them in his documents. I mean, he says not inhabited. In 1864, 250 years after John had arrived, Reverend Daniel Austin erected a monument with a triangular base that rose to three effigies of the heads of Turks he beheaded in Transylvania. However, the monument was destroyed in a storm, and 50 years later, in 1914, the New Hampshire Society of Colonial Wars restored it with a smaller granite block, and no Turk heads! Huh, yeah, that was a sad day. The monument still lies in Star Island to this very day. John Smith sadly died on June 21st, 1631. And his tomb is in the St. Sepulchre's Church in London with an inscription that reads, Here lies one conquered who has conquered kings. Too bad he couldn't conquer nine islands. He would have to deal with me. Of course. Well, could I choose the next topic? You've done well, Trip. Yes. Uh, could I maybe do some lore? I'd be flattered. Alright. Next time, some lore. <laughs> yes. Watch for the shark. Here come again. Really? Thanks for joining me on Trip Tips. Good evening.